All right, everybody, it is 4.30, so we're going to go ahead and get started here. Um, I'd like to begin by welcoming you all to our 2020 USQ Ignition Alumni Entrepreneurship Webinar Series. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we all meet today, regardless of where we are, and pay my respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. My name is Ken Gideon. I'm the Director of Alumni here at USQ. And joining us today, we feature our USQ alumnus, Simon Playford, who's one of the founders of Bolter. So Simon, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. A couple of quick reminders for all of you in the audience. First and foremost, just so that you know, um, in case you have not attended one of these types of webinars on Zoom before, um, the only people that you'll see here today are myself and Simon as the moderator and panelist of today's session. If you've got any questions throughout today, we are going to be um, inserting as many of your questions as we can. Um, Simon and I have also agreed that if there's still questions beyond 530, we will absolutely continue to stay here so that we can answer as many questions that each of you may have as possible. Just please remember to put those questions in the Q&A section, not in the open chat session. Also, just a couple of quick things for your knowledge. As I said, we're going to be recording today's session. Um, very likely on Monday morning, everyone who registered for today's session will receive an email from us that will have a direct link for the recording. It will have Simon's email address for you in case you would like to continue to ask any individualized legal advice from him. In addition to that, um, there will be some additional information in that email from Simon about a citing um, entrepreneurship initiative which he'll be telling us a little bit about later on today. But without further ado, now that I've gotten those um, housekeeping items out of the way, Simon, again, welcome and thanks for joining us. To start today, do you mind telling us a little bit about, you received your Bachelor of Business and Commerce and a Bachelor of Law from USQ in 2017. So can you tell us a little bit about why you decided to study law and why you chose USQ? Yeah, thank you, Ken. Um, and hello, everybody. Um, I really appreciate being involved in this entrepreneur series. I think it's a great initiative by USQ. And um, as you said, Ken, I, I studied there and I'm a proud alumnus of um, USQ. Uh, just before we start, we'll get into it. Typical lawyers, um, just a disclaimer for everybody that anything that we do will say in this presentation and the contents are general advice in nature and nothing too uh, specific. So if you'd like any further um, legal advice, definitely reach out to a professional, um, a qualified professional um, to, for that. Or talk to me. <laughs> um, okay, so backing down to my roots, uh, I'm from Pittsworth, which is about half an hour away from Toowoomba, um, towards west. And basically I, I was in the state schooling system there. Um, I got to year 12 and USQ through its uh, outreach pro programs um, for year 12ers um, offered certain scholarships and whatnot. So I was um, lucky enough to score a, uh, a scholarship there. I graduated with a fairly low IP, uh, OP, which was um, a 10, um, and was still accepted into USQ, which is fantastic. And from there, it was kind of uh, a, 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 a process for many years studying, uh, I think it was five and a half with the two degrees, um, and graduated in 2017. So. Jumping back to what really promoted me to kind of go on that journey is probably the legal studies in year 10 from the earliest um, I could go back. And what promoted the thought for me about law and what kind of inspired me to pursue that as a career path was more so the fact that there was something that kind of had a ripple effect through everything, every facet controlled us. Um, and it was this thing called law and it was sort of gray, a little bit of murkiness. Um, and I found that quite interesting and challenging. And even to this day, it's, it's probably the, the longest thing I've ever dedicated my life to. And it's probably the most enjoyable thing um, as well because it is so broad and the types of clients I get to work with. Um, and, and it's just, it's, you kind of learn something every day. And, and maybe that means I'm a perpetual student um, but I, I find uh, the, that was the, the motivating factor. And having USQ and Toowoomba so close to Pittsworth, um, I was able to still live with my mum for a year uh, before I moved into Toowoomba for the big smoke. 
Um, and then um, from there, I ended up um, in Brisbane um, to, to the even bigger smoke. Um, so, um, yeah, that, that's sort of my, my journey. And I, I can say um, wholeheartedly that USQ was a perfect choice, um, partly because of the dual degree that it offered, um, but also the smaller classes meant I now have, you know, a cohort of friends that I still remain very much into contact with and um, up to date with their progression in different fields, um, whether that's through um, foreign affairs or through law itself or through other avenues. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank, thanks for sharing that journey. The, the next question I want to ask you, Simon, is probably a little bit different than most because while we all know it's not uncommon to have lawyers be an entrepreneur, the number of lawyers who we know that have opened up their own firms is, is you know, so, so many, it's almost hard to count. What you've done with Bolter is quite a bit different than your typical law firm. So why don't you tell us a little bit about Bolter and the journey to creating it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so Bolter is, is like you said, a, a sort of different style of law firm. We've, uh, we've ditched the names, we've ditched sort of the traditional law firm vibe where you've got a sort of, sort of formality um, uh, uh, about it. And it's a recognition of the types of people that are startups, that are entrepreneurs. Um, they're not necessarily your sophisticated, um, you know, large organisations. Um, that want to be, you know, have that level of formality. That's not to say that they're not sophisticated. Um, it's just that that feeling that they um, are sort of needed to be respected, and there's certain stature as you know a CEO of a large multinational, for example. They're real people, and that's where the the Volta vibe kind of um, for me and, and the passion tries to stem towards. Uh, and so yeah, so it's it's a startup law firm for startups. And it targets, I guess, those, um, you know, initial stage sort of development um, from, you know, before conception of the idea, just wanting to know a little bit more about, you know, commercialization of, you know, IP or intellectual property to moving into the first few years of the business being up and running. Um, so, so and, you know, and where that takes us from there is, is you know, uh, an exciting path for, for any sort of business. So. That was a little bit of behind Bolter. It's, it's a full service law firm focusing on um, partnering with clients rather than um, just transactional based kind of work. I mean, we still do that, but my passion is obviously the client relationship and being on that journey with them in, in, in business. So um, we, we do anything from um, commercial, commercial and corporate law, straight through to intellectual property, to workplace, um, just nothing for like criminal or family or personal injury. That's kind of the out of my kettle of fish. Um, um, so yeah, so that's kind of a little bit of background around Bolter in, in what we do, where we came from, um, and a little bit about that side of the um, that side of the playing field. We started from a law firm in Toowoomba called Clifford Dawson Lawyers. Uh, that's the heritage uh, in my background. And from there, um, I, I basically pitched for funding for this idea of um, Bolta and was successful. And here we are today in terms of the, the, the product of that and the journey that I'm on um, as well with Bolta. So it's, it's, it's a nice um, breath of fresh air for those that are entrepreneurs, those that have creativity, innovation at the forefront of their mind. Mm. Well, well, thanks for that. And, and speaking of your roots, um, I'm going to ask you the first question from the audience before we even get to um, some of the other ones that you and I have spoken about. And I don't think he'll mind saying saying his let me saying his name. One of your mentors, Ben Goldson's online, and and he asks, how do you manage your time delivering legal advice with your time investing in building a new startup business? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ben. Um, I, I really appreciate uh, a fabulous guy. Um, it, that's a really interesting question because, it, and it comes down to probably where the conversation will lead on to this afternoon about sort of juggling priorities here. Um, you've you've got you've got your baby, you've got your passion, or you've got your hobby that you really want to you know put so much effort in, but then you've also got uh, your, you know your work and the grinding that needs to go on behind that. So that you know, you can flourish your business almost. So 
when it comes to Bolter and, and the way I um, deliver legal services as well as you know juggle building that new startup business, it's it's almost making sure that there's set boundaries and set parameters in your day day to day schedule, um, not crossing over to to family time too much or, or, or partner time or the, the hobby time that gives you that sense of um, stress relief. So it's it's delivering uh, sort of the the advice and the grinding work when you need to and, and juggling that priority whilst also you know pushing your efforts where you can um, into uh, you know marketing efforts or, uh, or, or you know workflow kind of building uh, and exploring new technology as well um, but again if, if that is your passion and, and bolt is my passion the other things and those little you know investigations into oh what's you know no code or or what's that new you know sort of workflow kind of tool or what's that automation tool that you're talking about all those sorts of things kind of are fun to explore because it has an attachment to your passion um, as well as will help that grinding work as well Simon another question we have from the audience and we're asking it because it's again very much about your initial starting up process somebody in the audience asked why did you decide to pitch the bolter within Clifford Goldson instead of actually going out and starting it completely on your own? Yeah, that, that's a very um, a very interesting uh, concept. It's it's or, or question, shall I say, one that I haven't really thought about, and, and particularly because of the 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 foundation there and the support network that Clifford Goldson provides, um, uh, both. To myself and and, and and Bolter, but also to Bolter's clients, and and the the important point to um, kind of reiterate here is is any startup lawyer or, or person starting out on their own will kind of literally be starting out on their own. So so building um, you know that expertise is, is is difficult because you're you're either really a sector based firm where you don't really have much else outside that knowledge. Or, um, or you have to kind of refer clients away and then slowly build your team to plug in those gaps. Whereas Bolter, we, we have the ability to you know, tap in to those experts when and as needed. And, and I think that for myself was a really big um, benefit to the client um, and to that end, end, end consumer for Bolter. And, and I think that's really what somebody needs. Um, yes, I, I know what I know, but I also know what I don't know. And that's where these little experts come into, um, come into play. And Simon, as you and I had spoken beforehand, I think it's almost as if without realizing it by having the backer to, backing of Clifford Goldson, it's almost as if they've got an entire team, even though it might just be you or one or, one or two people there, you've got that big backing that, you know, not only can you refer them to, but un unlike somebody that might be out there on their own, in their own firm, if there's something that you do have questions about, you've got um, an entire team of people at, at CG that you can actually, you know, you're still technically working for them as well, and, and you can go and bounce ideas and thoughts and things off of them, isn't it? Oh, 100%, 100%. And there's nothing um, that nothing that beats that experience and expertise um, a, a, as and when you need it. And, you know, the, the, the reason why, and one of the other reasons why the idea was pitched and, and Bolter is what it is, is I, I do have that very large foundation, um, almost general practitioner kind of um, bandwidth of knowledge about really small businesses and corporate matters. So I can advise most definitely on those really, main points in which entrepreneurs and side hustles and, 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 and small businesses really kind of go through in that initial stage. Um, and then when, when something is outside that knowledge, it's, it's being able to have somebody on tap without having to refer them or, or that client away to somebody you're just not really sure about the, um, um, about that sort of experience yep. um, that they will receive. Um, it's more, it, it's still kept within Volta. It's still, um, within that, and it's, it's just being on tap, which I, I think is a just a, a beautiful system that I, I, I'm really, really proud of. 
So, so Simon, on that vein, again, as we were talking about being that you are a little bit different than some of the other companies, can you, can you talk to those of us here um, today through what are some of the main types of legal issues that you guys deal with at Bolter? For someone, I, I know for a fact, I've seen a few of the names of the people that we have in the audience, and there's quite a few entrepreneurs here. So what are the types of issues do you think that many of them could come to you with to help that you could help them? Yeah, yeah, thanks. That's, that's a really... Um... It's a really important question um, because it, it, it basically there are there are a few trends that every startup or entrepreneur will go through, and and that is more so the fundamental business structure of, of, of what you're going to kind of operate from um, your your branding and your intellectual property. So you probably hear me refer to it as IP. Um, then you've got your sort of products and services. And that's sort of divided into two main elements where you've got your transaction. So, you know, whether that's through to your client or to the supplier, and then you've got the actual product and service itself and how that's delivered. Then you've got um, a couple of other key important points, which aren't really, that will really depend on, on, on your situation. One of them is uh, your current employer. So that's a really important point um, to raise with some startups and what an issue that entrepreneurs will have to really kind of look into. Uh, and, and a flow on from that is uh, an even more important element, which is confidentiality and, and the secrecy of your, your business. Um, so if you indulge me, I'll talk a little bit about each one of them. Um, sure. Because I think that'll be a bit more um, beneficial. When, you, when you're talking about business structuring, um, it's not always the most uh, it's quite easy to register yourself as an ABN under a sole trader. And, and that's, you know, it costs you 30 bucks, costs you 80 bucks for three years, easy. That may not be the most appropriate structure for yourself, particularly if you've got significant assets or you've got, uh, you know, family um, where your business has a bit of risk to it. So if you were, you know, selling, um, selling a chemical product or if you were, um, you know, selling popcorn, there could be some liability that arises from that if it was, you know, if there was some uh, defect or whatnot, which could result in harm, which could result in legal proceedings. And if you're a sole trader or if you're in a partnership, that all comes back on you as an individual. Whereas there are other structures out there which can help protect you and your house and your family from um, those, you know, uh, legal proceedings that come to an extent, um, obviously but it helps limit that liability overall. Um, so understanding your business structure um, is, is an important point. Understanding your position and, and what risk you're willing to take on as a um, entrepreneur is also another factor, important factor, uh, as well as having an open and frank discussion about um, with your accountant as well. Uh, I, I believe in business structuring advice kind of coming from a three tiered, um, three triangle, yourself, your accountant and a lawyer making sure your taxation um, and the benefits from the tax point of view for yourself as an individual and for the business and for your family, whether that's for trust is ticked off as well. So um, yeah, business structuring is an important one, um, not to just discredit, it may be better, better for your business to enter into sort of a company, a private company. Moving into sort of branding and intellectual property, you've got, uh, you've got your, you know, your, dam, your domain name, you can register a website, you can register an ABN, you can register a business name, um, and, and you can register a company as well. Um, all these are, are great things to do, and some people um, do that as a sort of branding, um, brand protection. So trying to secure everything attaching to your brand that it could do. And then you step into registered um, intellectual property. So that's your trademarking, so your logos and your sounds or your slogans registering those against your, um, your, I guess, your, your goods and services that you're providing to kind of distinguish yourself. So you can section there, um, and as well as other IP, uh, which we, we might speak about a bit later on. So you've kind of got your bare basic kind of um, branding, protecting uh, your IP kind of, uh, you know, subject as well, section. The next one is products and services, transactional, and the product itself. Um, so the transactions, obviously, what, what, they're contractually speaking between yourself and the consumer or the supplier or the manufacturer that will, you know, center around the product and service and which protects yourself, 
uh, and also sets you know, your standards of service delivery. Um, and then you've got uh, your, your the products and service of itself. So whether that's an app or whether that's um, you know a manufacturer that needs to produce something or you're going to be producing it yourself in a warehouse. Um, so it's sort of sorting out what it is with that um, product and service that you have yourself, what are the regulatory requirements that go with that, licensing um, and, and whatnot to, from that, the labeling, um, that's a big one that comes up um, as well. So that's your products and services sort of transaction and what about the product itself? Then you step into your, your, your current employment agreement. So making sure that if you are thinking about an idea or you are developing an idea, making sure that you're um, sort of Depending on what you want to do, uh, if you want to ask your employer or employment to get on board with it or express your idea and see if they can give you some backing or develop it together, um, absolutely, that's fantastic. You can do that. Um, but usually a standard clause in employment contracts, um, anything that's developed at work or from work or with work equipment, and whether that's, you know, material that you write or, or documents that you develop or policies or, or an idea or a design. Usually there are clauses in um, employment agreements that make whatever IP you create best back to your employer. So that's really important or, or, or um, having a sort of an assignment automatically. So you've just got to make sure that you're checking your employment contract and, and seeing what provisions um, um, are in relation to your IP and what you create during work. But otherwise making sure that you kind of you keeping a barrier between your hobby and what you want to develop as yourself and your entrepreneurial skills outside of work and what you're doing during work um, and also checking your contracts there and also restraint provisions and non-competes particularly if it's the same sort of um, same sort of thing that you're doing or similar uh, and all which could involve soliciting of clients at some point in time um, so, Simon, with that, just very quickly, one of the yeah. things that you and I spoke about ahead of time that a lot of people may not realize that, you know, probably one of the most important cases of an entrepreneur trying to start was the giant, the David versus Goliath when Hungry Jacks came into Australia. And as many of you may know, Hungry Jacks is called Burger King in the United States where they originated. Yet, because the company, I believe it was in Western Australia, had registered their company name as Burger King here with the appropriate authorities. And so when Burger King tried to sue them, the company here called Burger King actually won, even though they only had one or two locations, but they had gone through all the proper channels here in Australia. So Burger, Burger King had to change their company name here to Hungry Jack's. Yeah, hundred percent. And um, from my um, knowledge, Burger King incidentally let, let their trademark of Burger King in Australia lapse. And, and that's where um, there was some sort of proceedings or infringement um, or negotiation between Burger King in America and um, Burger King in Australia, which didn't uh, obviously turn out in some sort of commercial arrangement. So yeah, so that's, um, that, that, that's a really, really interesting point. And, and that also comes back into your brand and your IP and making sure you're protecting um, your, your key assets and of your brand, which is sort of your logo and your, and your sort of slogan. Um, outside of just your company name, outside of your domain name, outside of your uh, business name, because well, those three things that I've just spoken about, they don't give you, you know, proprietary ownership in yep. in, in those. Yeah, so it, it's that trademark that gives you that value and um, that true ownership, which then, you know, you can go license out if you need. Um, and there are other contractual arrangements that you can um, put in play as well. Um, so ideally in that situation, um, Burger King, in Australia could have potentially licensed that trademark Burger King back to um, Burger King in the US um, for use for X, Y, Z amount of dollars. Um, but obviously there, there's no arrangement that came to play. So, and that, yeah, I, I think I'm gathering that was a story, but that's your sort of um, um, situation you're dealing with. Simon, a quick question that somebody asked that's relevant to what we're talking about now is, um, can you talk a little bit about what you have seen as the most common mistake by a startup which has already commenced? For example, they've already started, they come to you after they've started, and then maybe they realize that they should have come to you sooner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yep. Um, probably, probably the biggest one is, uh, it's, it's the two. 
if I can do that. Please. Uh, you've got, <laughs> yeah, you've got your, it, it does come down to that br branding and IP sort of thing. I, I think the transaction and contractual documents that you have, like I was talking about you, you, with your consumer or with other suppliers, they, they should be um, dealt with, but they, you know, they can, they're, they're not necessarily instrumental. Well, they are instrumental, but it, what my point is, is that it's, it can wait for a little bit if you've got some sort of terms and conditions that you've used off websites or whatnot. That's not definitely not my recommendation, but bringing it back to what the branding and IP sort of point is, is that if you've named your business XYZ and you've done, you've done a website development, you've spent so much money, you've created an app, and then you go down the track and then you realize, oh wait, it's already taken. Um, then that's where the expense rolls in because you haven't done those bare basic sort of searches or that brand checking um, to be able to ensure that you can secure that name. So um, uh, a, a good example for, for, for myself is, is Bolter. Unfortunately, uh, I got down the road and, and Bolter was not available as a uh, registered business name. So, um, and branding had already been completed. So luckily we have decided the name Bolter to make it happen. Um, so it, that's a really interesting uh, first hand experience that I dealt with after getting, um, you know, the horses bolted. And then I realized, oh, you know, Fudge, I haven't done this. You know, I didn't go further into that. So that's a really good example of uh, a first hand experience. So you've got that branding and IP. And then immediately after you've got to do your terms and conditions and your contractual documents. But the other thing that I was going to say is, is keeping your uh, important invention or your product or service confidential and, and having an, an, an understanding of, okay, if I do have a new process, if I do have a new piece of machinery, if I do have a design, um, is it uh, contracting with an uh, you know, intellectual property lawyer, talking to myself as somebody, um, a qualified professional, about that new idea, new invention, before you go and build that website, before you go and talk to people, before you go and um, start testing the market with your minimal viable product. The critical thing for patents is in Australia is making sure that there has been no public knowledge about that invention or that new process. So that is a really important element. Um, and, and that's where IP lawyers come in to an extent before we have to engage patent attorneys who are the registered um, uh, attorneys that can talk to you about um, patents and give you advice on patents. Um, we know some ba basic information as IP lawyers. Um, but yes, you, you're, you need to keep it secret. You need to have confidentiality agreements in play, um, non-disclosure agreements um, with your contractors, whether that is you know, getting some of the builder piece of equipment, even if it's Joe Bloggs from down the road that you've known for 10 years, it's so, so important that, um, you know, entrepreneurs are considering the secrecy of their um, uh, and confidentiality of their idea and their innovation. Simon, on that note, um, you know, you were talking about the how different Bolter is compared to your typical law firm and, and things like that. Um, a couple of people have actually asked, and you and I had talked about this anyway, I was going to ask you, what are the types of unique challenges that you faced in starting Bolter compared to a different type of law firm that somebody else might have started. Yeah, it, it's sort of it's sort of figuring figuring out yourself is probably and figuring out yourself your product and how that solves the issues for for startups and entrepreneurs. I think a lot of law firms sort of try to you know throw throw caution in the wind and go go for every uh, every person and their dog in terms of the clients and having that really understanding of a niche area of clientele is, is so critical important for that client uh, and also yourself in your development uh, as an as a advisor almost. So one of the uh, important things that I figured out was, okay, the, this is the client that I vibe with really well and I love to work with uh, and, and, I, and I get energized from. What are their issues? And these are the sort of product development stages that I kind of went through. Uh, and then I moved into, okay, I've got the, I've got the clientele. I, I know what they're about. Um, you obviously don't ever know enough about your clients. Um, and, and that's another factor that I worked into is that relationship and partnership, partnership sort of 
feeling that I want to um, emit as much as possible. So you've got your, your clients, their issues, the solutions tailored to the, your clients and then sort of bring it back to yourself and, and, and the brand and what you kind of want to portray. That's a really great segue and answer and segue into the next question, if you will, Simon, because, you know, on your website, one of the things that you talk about is providing a, a value pack to your customers. And, you know, one of the things you and I had spoken about leading into today was how your hope is, you know, in targeting entrepreneurs, you want to be able to provide them as much of a one-stop shop for their legal issues as you can, which again is part of what makes that really great partnership you have with Clifford Goldson so important. So do you mind elaborating a little bit more, particularly since I know there are so many entrepreneurs in the audience, what is that value pack about and how do you add value to your potential customers? Yeah, 100%. And, and the, the, the best thing um, that I thought about was, okay, We've got these issues, and as I spoke about before, you've kind of got this these, this trend between um, what sort of startups need at that early stage. So whether it is you know incorporating a company, giving you business advice, or, or registering a trademark, or developing those you know website terms and conditions, privacy policies, those sort of tailored documents that really shouldn't be copy and pasted from online, um, but need a bit of tailoring to the business. So it's it's about identifying those key problems as i kind of elaborated on before and going okay we know the problems what are the solutions and what are the solutions tailored to startups and entrepreneurs and the important part um that i sort of basically have, have come to the conclusion of is education for entrepreneurs is an important thing and a, and a key role as um you know the lawyers but any sort of business advisor needs to sort of really appreciate is um, you know, upskilling your clients almost with the ability to um, uh, go, you know, with a bit of knowledge about the documents. It's, it's fine to be able to go, oh, you know, we, we, we'll, we'll draft a shareholders agreement for you. Um, we'll get some instructions and the way we go. But it's, or we'll register a trademark for you. But it's really that extra extra step that you can you need to go to go and go, okay, what is, what is a trademark? Have you been able to understand what it is or what the... Uh, the benefits are, what are the negatives, how much is it going to cost you. So this is where the value packaging kind of came into play, where recognizing those issues, making solutions, tailoring them to uh, startups and entrepreneurs, and making them affordable, uh, and, and just kind of covering off those big, um, uh, big sort of common issues. Uh, but yes, yeah, so education is a, an important part of the, of the value pack, and you'll probably see some. Um, um, trends are there, and, and and I hope to develop more uh, as we, as we grow. Mm. So thank you for that, Simon. And, and again, we're still on the very early stages. And and uh, one of the questions yeah. that came through was someone was asking what your personal opinion is on the importance of a startup plan when you're creating a business, and and what's the advice that you might give to people on that? Yeah, yeah. Look, uh, that's I I can never ever say that business planning is useless or time wasted because it's absolutely not. Um, it, it, myself, it, it took me when I was doing the business plan for Volta many mornings um, and many coffees to kind of develop the, the plan itself because it, you're almost hitting, hitting the books, researching and then formulating a plan forward or char charting a course and setting out what your goals are. And sort of balancing the books, understanding estimates, making sure that they're realistic estimates. And all that happens before you sort of dip your toe. And without all that, if you just went and dip your, dip your toe and spent a lot of money dipping your toe um, or jumping straight in the deep end, you're kind of doing yourself a disservice in my opinion, because yes, you might have a brilliant idea and Yes, it's probably amazing and the people around you, if you've told them, they're probably egging you on to, you know, get out there and take the leap. But you haven't tested the market. You haven't done your market research. Um, you don't really have a goal. What happens if it doesn't, if it flops or, or, or if you have a bit of a hiccup? Have you got a plan to be able to just sidestep? Pivot is a word at the moment, apparently. Hashtag pivot. Um, to really kind of 
put yourself on a course correct, still following that vision and maybe even altering your, your product or what your idea of a product was. So business planning is very important. Um, hitting the books and doing your, your research, particularly on the market. The Australian Bureau of Statistics has heaps of information, um, heaps of consumer information as well. Uh, and, and, it, and even the budget has revealed some areas of um, it, which are probably going to be seeing a lot more funding, a lot more traction in the years to come. So the, using the information that's out there um, and and suggesting that there's no information out there is, is, is also questionable because we're in a, a global age of information, an age of global information. So everything is accessible if you just um, spend some time to do it. So even if it's just a, it's just a uh, very simple plan, um, it's still something to go off and to remind yourself and use in many years to come. Simon, again, still talking early stages, if someone's yep. being an entrepreneur and, and they decide that they need to actually engage a lawyer, what type of advice would you give an entrepreneur before they go out and, and engage you or, or another lawyer? Yeah, yeah, and that's a, that's a very good question because we get that a fair, a fair bit when we do sort of seminars um, um, for, for people. And, and I think it comes back to making sure they're the right fit for you. Um, and, and you may meet a couple of lawyers, you might speak to them on the phone, and you just don't really get it, or, or they just don't seem to really get your business. Um, I think that's really important. Um, and having that clear communication from the beginning, making sure your expectations of the client, you're, you're aware of that, whether it's you know uh, giving clear instructions or, or um, asking questions back to the lawyer, um, what responsiveness is another one. So clear communication, responsiveness. Um, uh, you've also got probably, you probably get a lot of conversations around costing. So making sure you're upfront with your budget from day one. But with that comes understanding the true value of the document really for your business. So yes, you know, a shareholders agreement or, you know, a set of terms and conditions or, or, or a unique uh, transaction um, or if you're out in business for a year and you want to purchase another business. Yes, there is a sum of money that is payable for that, um, whether it's a fixed fee, whether it's a fee estimate, um, which, which could rise or subject to rising costs. Or you just need to really think about what is the va true value to the business of this service that I'm getting and talk about costs and talk about budgets. So that's probably the next um, next point. Making sure that there's, you keep them on side, don't do anything without really checking or letting them know, um, as in don't go make a deal and then come to us. It's, 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 well, you can do that, but it'd, it'd be preferable, um, preferable if you let lawyers involved in that early stage discussion because there are things that you may not know as an entrepreneur, um, maybe that's from a taxation point of view or, or an implication that may occur if you're you know, down the track, um, but you, you know, you've made the deal and then that's an afterthought and then you kind of almost get quite frustrated with um, lawyers because you're like, oh, well, you didn't tell me about that. So it's really important to kind of um, you know, not engage with you know, side conversations or negotiations or deal making without really just letting us know because you know, we're on your side. And um, although there's a you know, reputation that we are deal breakers, um, we're, we're here to sort of support you and partner with you. And it's important and our duty as an advisor to you to let you know what the issues are that may arise. So yeah, yeah, costs, um, just be upfront about the um, budget, um, making sure responsiveness and expectations around communication are set both ways, trying to keep lawyers in the loop um, and, and, and allow them to do what they do best, and that's advise you um, on where to go from there. Simon, we have a, sure about, yeah, sorry. Oh, I was going to say, we have a follow-up question from the audience yeah. on this, if you don't mind. Um, Anne-Marie asks, so entrepreneurs may need skills and training without a full awareness of legislation and legal systems. Mm -hmm. Entrepreneurs also work with unforeseen risks and new and shifting markets. What advice do you have about navigating these types of circumstances? In, in terms of navigating risks 
for entrepreneurs and uh, I'm just seeing marketing. And not having the skills and full mm -hmm. awareness of the legislation and those systems. Yeah. Again, it comes back to the people that you've got on your bus, um, whether that are, that is your finance advisors or financial advisors or your accounting advisors. They have specialized knowledge that I don't have, <clears throat> um, but we have specialized knowledge that they don't have. So it's, it's making sure that you do have the right people on the bus that can advise you and you feel comfortable in just giving them a call and going, hey, I've got this weird thing that's happening. Um, what, what's your thoughts um, and, and you know, can you put some thoughts into that for us? Feeling comfortable in having those conversations um, stems back to relationships. So I think that's really important, finding the right people on your bus, forming those relationships. But when there are sort of uh, those questions that you don't want to bother those people um, for, for whatever reason, or you feel uncomfortable to do so, there are um, definitely a variety of um, services out there on the internet that could provide um, some preliminary sort of limited advice on, on different issues, whether that is a general you know, Australian Google search, whether that is a, um, um, a, a, a lot of the Australian Securities and Investments Commission, as well as the Australian Business Register, ABR, they have some um, absolutely stunning free uh, um, important, um, I guess, search engines for grants and funding, search engines for licensing issues um, or, or, or products um, and um, any sort of local government to state government to federal government licensing kind of um, requirements. So there are a lot of different services out there. Um, and the other thing to probably keep an eye out are the, uh, the rise of sort of Facebook and um, social media groups, which uh, do help facilitate a knowledge sharing um, system where somebody asks a question and there are 200 other people that are able to support that person. And they're all entrepreneurs and they're all startups. Um, so they all get it, but they need to, they need to help each other out. Thank you for that. Now, now, Simon, the next question I'm going to ask is, is a fairly standard question, but I think it's a really good standard question to ask because most highly successful people in the world always talk about they don't get to where they are without first making some big mistakes and oftentimes admitting those mistakes and moving forward. And, you know, you've already spoken about one today in, in terms of Bolter's name and, you know, you'd already bolted down the track and, and had thought yeah. about it. But for, for maybe using another example, it would do you mind sharing with the audience perhaps another mistake that you know you've made going down this road of becoming an entrepreneur that others might learn from? You know, I, I guess a typical response would be uh, a mistake is never really a mistake, but a, a lesson learned, um, and and that was a really good example that you, you've given. Probably, if if I can touch on what lessons I've learned from my experience. Um, so far with Bolter is just, I guess, I, I, I have a tendency to, to rush things and not, um, not necessarily have that finishing ability. Uh, I'm, I'm a starter and I get all excited and I just, you know, don't finish it. And that's something in my personality trait that I, I completely are aware of and acknowledge and I work on from time to time. So I think one of the mistakes that I've made is just not, you know, taking a pause, taking my time and realizing that, you know, 80% is of a hundred is bloody good. So you just, you just take your time and um, making sure that you're beating yourself up with a feather and not a brick. And I think that's probably the most important um, lessons learned from a, a bunch of mistakes that I've made um, over the last few years, but yeah. So stemming from that, and, and you talked about lessons learned, let, let's talk about the positive side for a moment. Um, can you tell us maybe what you think is the best investment that you've made in your business that you know has been quite successful and that you're really proud of? Probably the best investment that I've made in Volter is, is the, the making sure you are involved and um, your, your passion and, and I keep talking about this Volta vibe, but your vibe is ever so present in yourself and the way you authentically be with people uh, and the way you authentically present, whether that's, you know, online or whether that's in person or over the phone, just making sure that you're, you're, you're being your, your true self and bringing your whole self to the, to the, to the occasion. And I think clients respect that as well. Um, 
I think being yourself is probably the most important investment that I've made and making sure that that um, emanates through the, the different, uh, whether that's through a piece of advice that I draft, whether that's through um, you know, a phone call or, or, or a media statement or a post of some sort. It's just making sure that you're, yourself, you're, you're your biggest investment and that is what needs to come through uh, in, your, in your service and in, in your um, business. So that's terrific. Really yeah. Thank you for that. Now, now, Simon, this is the, the next question here is actually one that you and I spoke quite a bit about last week when, when we met. Um, and we anticipated this question was going to come up, but Shane has asked, so what are the legal complications of a student developing a product or an idea, any product or design and inventions within a school or a university that they develop? Is it the school's property or is it theirs? And what should students know before they start working on those types of projects? Now, I'm going to, Shane, alter that a little bit because one of the, literally, Simon and I spoke about this particular topic, I think for almost 30 minutes, um, because I hear all the time when I'm talking to our alumni who are entrepreneurs, they're often very afraid to talk to anyone about their idea before it gets patented because they're deathly afraid of somebody taking that idea and running with it, perhaps someone that might have more money than them and stealing that idea and going out and getting it patented before they actually have the opportunity to do that. So while I know Shane's question was in particular about students and, and universities, I don't know if that's your specialty. I don't know if you can actually answer that, but I would like to put it a little bit more in that broader context and ask you to talk about any advice and those types of things that you'd give people on that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's a very, very good question. Typically, you go to a university and you study a course, and then the outcome is you finish your course and move on to bigger and better things. But for those that, um, you know, stay within the higher education system as, as continued students uh, of, um, of academia, and developing their, you know, PhDs and, and, and studying their doctorates in that sort of research and theoretical side of, um, and, and which spits out, you know, opportunities and spits out um, intellectual property and commercialization of that intellectual property is a key driver for most universities. And that's why they make the, the big investments in um, hiring a lot of um, PhD students um, or, or having them um, continue in the, that research funded by them um, because they, you know, there is an element of, you know, this could be the next unicorn essentially. So my advice to that sort of situation is probably definitely going back to the, I'm sure that um, the enrollment package at any sort of university would have an element of, uh, or an, a policy document on intellectual property and student participation in that sort of um, intellectual property type of arrangement, whether that's a research project um, or, or, or a group project. So going back to that policy, um, if you are already bolted and the um, course has left the gate and you're three years into a six year PhD and you're just like, oh, what's in it for me? Or what can I take away from this? Again, that is something that at that stage, go back to the foundational documents that you signed with that university, go back to those sort of um, um, the, that arrangement that you've, you've entered into and sort of understand and read through that. If you need somebody to have a look over that, obtain some advice over that. Um, but what happens from there is, 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 is definitely um, fluid. It, it could be, it could be, in a, it could be a, um, an arrangement that you come to with that university or that um, educational facility in which, you know, there is a sort of joint ownership um, um, of that intellectual property or the commercialization or the exploitation of that um, of that intellectual property there could be a joint ownership there could be a funding you know it may be a great opportunity maybe the university wants to go or the higher education facility goes hey we really like that idea we recognize that you as a researcher are instrumental in that idea and you have all that knowledge and that background um context in that intellectual property so we're going to keep you on um, we want to start this little business. How about that? And here's what's in it for you. Here's what's in it for us. So there, there are all sorts of transactions that could kind of like, you know, almost result from that um, over time. So and, and Simon, it goes back to what you were saying earlier, I think as well, that this is part of why it's really important to talk to a lawyer 
ahead of time. Don't wait until you've already put the idea down and you've submitted it or given it to somebody. If you think that there's a possibility of something like that happening, make sure you talk to somebody early. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and I know, and I completely recognize that it is really difficult to know what's going to happen. And at the start of a PhD, for example, or at the start of a project, you're not going to really know what's going to happen you know, six years down the track, a lot can happen, COVID can happen. Um, and and you, you don't know that. So how do you know what you're, you know, signing up to? So you just have to make sure that you're really um, crossing your T's, dotting your I's, not just accepting the terms and conditions, not just accepting the privacy policies online, as we all probably do and should read, um, taking some time and just going, okay, I'm entering into an actual legally binding contract here. What are my rights and what happens? And, and I think that's a really fundamental key point or key takeaway for anybody in that position, um, whether that is at work or whether that is in, in sort of higher education research. Simon, there's a follow-up question from uh, Shayla in the audience. And, and she said that the fear is, the fear that you were just talking about is quite common with artists and creative writers. And what advice do you have regarding entrepreneurs where the self and the creation or personal work is the product? For example, indie authors, graphic artists, freelance editors, et cetera. And again, you and I spoke about this before as well. Yeah, uh, and I think it sort of touches on copyright law and, and, and copyright generally, which is a really interesting area of intellectual property because it one in Australia has automatic um, automatic rights provided to the to the original expression of, of, of that um, idea. It, and it, it's difficult because there could be at any one moment at, or any one point in time competing copyright interests in, in that one work. So again, when it comes to those situations for artists and, artists and um, uh, other creative writers, Yes, if you write something on a piece of paper, that original expression uh, in its material form, whether that's paper or electronic, is protected by copyright um, and it doesn't need to be registered. The next step in that is identifying, okay, under what circumstance has this been drafted? Um, what, are, what are the background information or, or context that I need to really inform where that right of ownership of that copyright sits um, and whether under any sort of contractual agreement that you have, if you're a creative writer as a contractor, or if you're um, an artist contracting with somebody to create a set piece of, um, you know, unique artwork, it's having a look at that base document, and um, we, and if there is none, then it's a you know it's a common law sort of situation where um, you don't have necessarily a contract. You may have a verbal agreement. What were the terms of that? So. I think a key piece of information is is making sure you understand in what context you're writing or, or doing performing that work. If it's for yourself, fantastic. That's automatically yours unless it's um, plagiarised or fraudulent, um, which other copyrights would be at play. Um, if it is in a contractual arrangement sort of setting, then you've probably got a competing copyright interest in that material because they've paid for it um, or there is a service. And then it goes back to okay, well. If there is a potential chance for a competing interest, what are the contractual provisions around that? Was, was there a verbal agreement? Was there a contractual provision? But usually um, those are sort of the questions um, and, and that's where your kind of documents come into play when you're, when you're contracted. So though you'll probably see some uh, intellectual property clauses or confidentiality clauses in um, agreements, which suggests that anything that you do, whether that's copyright or whether that's you know, a design or an idea, is assigned back to, to the um, copyright owner. Mm. Terrific. Now, now, guys, it's 524. I just want to reiterate for those of you that might have come in a few minutes later, Simon has absolutely agreed to stay on so that we can try and answer um, as many questions as you have as possible. Um, but I do know that there are one or two of you that definitely have, ex have said you've got to leave at 530. So there's two questions that I wanted to make sure that we got to before um, some of you do have to log off and we'll still get to a few others. And one of them, Simon, stems back to something you just mentioned a few moments ago. And we can't, in this day and age have a conversation about 2020 without talking as you just did about COVID. And I think what makes this not only a unique year because of COVID, 
It's also quite an interesting circumstance for you because if I'm not mistaken in the conversations we've had, you've just started Bolter this year. So you're starting Bolter and then all of a sudden COVID hits. How has COVID then impacted you being a brand new entrepreneur trying to get into the marketplace, et cetera? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was really funny because I guess I, I have been planning and, and developing Volta for, you know, nine months before we sort of went out uh, and, and launched it. And it was really, really interesting because I had, I had um, left Toowoomba and moved to Brisbane. I had all these plans about, oh, yeah, you know, I'm going to go out and network and I'm going to go out um, and, and, you know, meet lots of people and, and, and have all these one uh, fabulous ideas. But, uh, you know, COVID came and um, changed things and mix things up um it, it i guess for me and in, in what changed with Volta was probably the avenue in which we communicate with clients uh and and one thing that i i found and i saw a lot within the profession uh is this sort of sort of recognizing oh you know our clients are sort of humans too and, and we need to be empathetic to them and, and, and i mean i've always sort of um, always been uh, empathetic and I, and I certainly love uh, I think feel like that's a beautiful thing to do and, and a, a sort of yeah, a bare basic human trait that everybody should have a level of empathy um, but I think a lot of lawyers kind of get caught up in the black and white and don't necessarily realize that, um, that those, those empathetic conversations and reaching out is, is a significantly important part of anybody's um, um, relationship so I think it's a recognition uh, recognition of um, that relationship for me though it was that communication avenue the use of tech and and moving towards um technology-based services um or, or provision of if we can um and, and i guess you know zoom and these virtual conversations and webinars uh were able to really be used to the best advantages that they have probably have never been before and it comes back to the communication as well um I, you know, I, I could never have thought of having a virtual coffee with a group of people and having a chat over, um, over, over, over virtual um, conferencing, and and this is now a thing, and and it's kind of exciting and and lovely and 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 um, all that, as much as that other side of um, having a personal um a, a person personal talk to, um, physically, is there too. So it, it's now a balancing act and and a preference for anybody. It's always now the offer is there for whatever whatever avenue a client would like to meet. So, yeah. Ter terrific. Thank you for that. And and again, the other question, and guys, don't feel as if we are running away because we're not. There's still a few questions we need to ask here, but the other one, Simon, that you and I spoke spoke about quite a bit, and and coming from your background at Clifford Goldson, and I know how important community involvement is to Clifford Goldson. How has that translated to Bolter and the importance of being a good you know, as we all hear, a good corporate citizen and, and being involved in the community. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it, I, I believe there is a turn of a century where there will be a higher importance placed from clients um, on the sort of ethical and social uh, and, and moral alignment with advisors and who they do dealings with. So, and I think that is a, that is an amazing thing for businesses to have to kind of now go, oh, you know, what are my you know, social stances on certain issues or what, what are those sorts of um, uh, important pillars that I am uh, involved with or want to stand for as a business? Um, so I think that there's going to be a turn where clients look at those sort of um, social enterprises that businesses um, reach out to and donate to and, and exercise a level of um, care for. And, and moving on from that, I, I, I guess my own history, um, I kind of have always had this sense of community is an important element of any sort of life because it's, it's and supporting that community which supports you is probably um, one of my sort of values really. Uh, and I think that stems from when I was a child, my father was involved with the local council, he was a councillor in our little small little shire. So, I got, uh, and, and with his passing, a lot of the, uh, and I was quite young, and a lot of the community was sort of supported me during that in, in our family. So I think that was probably the first time I was like, oh, 
community is very, very important and supported me. So I sort of feel indebted almost. And it's, and it's for me, I, I, I'm now involved with Headspace and Toowoomba, um, as well as I've had experience on different boards um, for, um, you know, sort of not-for-profits as much as possible. Um, for Bolta though, it, it's about supporting that community um, every way we can. And like, like you mentioned before, we do have a sort of little giant startup grant at the moment, which is posed to help businesses and um, kind of capitalising that entrepreneurial spirit. Um, and, and although that's not necessarily community give, giving back, it's, it's there to support this sort of ecosystem um, in Australia for startups, um, which, which will have a sort of grant um, amount allocated then for that grant winner. So yeah, it, I find it supporting the community that supports you is a fundamental value um, of mine as, as Lee's following it. It, it's interesting in your answer there, Simon, you were talking about not-for-profits and, and one of the questions that somebody in the audience has asked was, do you work with social entrepreneurs and not-for-profits making the world a better place? Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, I've had my fair share of experience in working for not, the not-for-profits. I was a director of a not-for-profit in, in, in Toowoomba, um, but also I, and there's also a headspace that I um, spent some time as the chair of the, their consortium board for, but also in helping service clients in the not-for-profit sector. Um, I absolutely do. And, and I think that probably gives me some of the most joy, um, if I'm completely honest, because you know that they're fundamental, fundamentally doing this for the better of the, the world. And, and something that you don't necessarily always get with a private company because there are shareholders and there are dividends needing to be paid but ultimately a not-for-profit is there for its members and working with that whether that's a health service whether that's um you know another facet is is just probably the most rewarding experience and absolutely now, now the next question we we anticipated this one as well and you and i spoke about this because i asked you this exact same question myself first of all we all know that Lawyers in general, particularly long, young lawyers, are often expected to work extremely long hours. In addition to that, we all know and we hear the stories every day about entrepreneurs and how long, particularly when you're just starting a business, how many hours you have to put in. So, so you have in your situation two mammoth <laughs> situations which usually require a great deal of time. So putting those into context and the question that somebody asked is, how do you achieve a work-life balance personally, particularly when you've got mm. these two ridiculous situations in front of you that often require a great deal of your time to succeed? Yeah, that, that yeah, you, you <laughs> hit the nail on the head in terms of it's a double bammy, really. Um, so, I, I, I guess what's what's really important with work-life balance is uh, ensuring that the time spent at work is productive and um, making sure you're, you're doing what you need to do to perform. But there is that home life, and and I think I was lucky enough to experience a relationship where I was quite young as a um, junior practitioner, and I did spend a lot of time at work, which. Uh, and that relationship evidently failed, uh, and that was a playing factor. And, and I think that really woke me up to understanding, hey, this is um, this is something that I need to be cautious of because there is, there are things out there outside of work and outside of your hobby that you need to pay attention to as well, and not getting too caught up on that um, that passion, um, and and then setting the and setting those sort of boundaries. So work life balance. Um, you know, is always a work in progress. I'm still not the best at it. Um, and like you said, it's a bit of a double whammy. So um, I, I do tend to sometimes work longer hours and, and um, be too passionate. But I mean, it, it's a bit of, it's, it's a learning experience, putting in those boundaries, making sure you have those little, little time of day that's yours and that you can kind of, you know, rejuvenate yourself ready for the next day or plan the next day. Um, have some time off clear your mind, whether that's a, a stroll, I usually go for a stroll around um, three o'clock in the afternoon or after lunch, I always have a morning coffee, um, uh, even, even if that means waking up an, an hour or two earlier um, than usual, having, having those little dedicated times where you just use it encourage, uh, and not necessarily um, uh, lose it overall. So yeah, encouraging um, breaks and those stress relieving um, attributes. But I mean, every, uh, I think, yeah, it's a work in progress, and you can never be right. 
and you'll always work really hard and um, some days you'll win, some days you'll lose and it will really frustrate you and um, annoy you. But just, just remembering and having faith that you, your little incremental steps over time, even if you don't work too hard one day, will still have a ripple effect for tomorrow. So. Terrific. And I think the last question we have from the audience, and I, again, thank you so much for staying beyond 530. Um, one of the other lawyers, Jen, I think she just left, but um, Jen, who's been uh, an alumnus of ours for a while, asked, Simon, why did you go down this road instead of choosing something like family law? Yeah. Okay. Um, that's, that's really difficult. It, it, I don't really know. I, I've only ever worked in corporate and commercial uh, practice, so I don't really have a taste of everything else. I'm sort of, I, I guess you have to be a certain type of personality to be able to deal with the stresses and the subject matter in which family law comes to cross, comes across, same with criminal law, same with personal injury. Uh, and, and I found automatically as a student at USQ a, and even pre-USQ a tendency to err on the side of business and language, those sorts of subjects and drama and um, not the science-y kind of uh, sort of uh, subjects. So that was out the door. Business, business and law, corporate law sort of kind of appealed in that sense. Um, and then moving into intellectual property in particular, that is so different and you sort of can't really comprehend the intangible it doesn't intellectual property doesn't necessarily feel like it's got value but there is value so i found that really really interesting because it sort of piqued an interest of mine saying oh well, i don't know what that is i'm going to find out and i really liked it um and and it, another area that i that i would love to pursue is, is as i was saying um face law before it's going to happen it is going to happen you and me both. I'm a, I'm a big sci-fi geek, as you know. Now, Simon, it's about 540. I think we've exhausted questions from the audience. So before we wrap up, are there any last parting words of advice or thoughts that you'd like to leave our audience with today? I guess just if, if you are an entrepreneur, if you are a startup, um, making sure you, you're hitting the business planning at the first instance, really investigating and challenging your assumptions about your, your product or service, um, figuring out what's out there already and what information you can you can grab to be able to utilize. Um, when you do come to a, you know a, a point in time where you're going, okay, I feel quite comfortable now engaging you know lawyers or speaking with lawyers, particularly those that do consult for free, which which we do um, initial consult. So speaking with somebody at that initial stage, getting their background, um, and and sort of going, okay, well that's what they've said. This is the advice we've given. Now we can go back to our business plan and maybe plan a little bit more before we go and take that leap and spend that money. So just making sure that, you know, you're chipping away at it, you're building that business plan and, and laying the, laying the flat foundations for, for a really prosperous business and um, just, just enjoying, really enjoy the ride as it comes because if there's going to be some hard days and there's going to be some, um, and, and some absolute wins, um, but just having faith and, and those incremental steps over time, can never do you wrong. So yeah, keep keep in there, hang in there, and just take every step that you can one day at a time. Simon Playford, I want to thank you so much for all of the time leading up to today and for taking the time today to share your thoughts, ideas, words of wisdom. Again, as a reminder to everyone in the audience, um, we will be sending everyone who registered um, uh, an email, a follow-up email with a link to the video so you can see any part that you may have missed. And it will also include Simon's email address so you can email him for any further advice. Simon, thank you so much again. Have a great evening and thank you all in the audience for for taking the time out of your days to join us. So take yeah, care, everyone. You. Thanks, everybody. Bye.